Hello, I'm Grace Gardner, and I'm Sylvine Gardner, and we are doing a junior group performance on Spartacus, the movie that broke the blacklist. I, Joseph McCarthy, have here in my hand a list of 205 names who were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party, and who are nevertheless still working and shaping policy in the State Department. Joseph McCarthy gave this call to alarm numerous times, each time changing his numbers. But during the Cold War, following World War II, American fear of communist subversion was so great, many hesitated to challenge McCarthy's accusations. Together with HUAC, the House on Un-American Activities Committee in Congress, McCarthy manipulated fears of communism to spread accusations to citizens outside of government. Soon, many industries were feeling HUAC's push. Anyone called for the committee risked having their reputation destroyed, and soon HUAC's power was so great, people deferred to them. In 1947, under pressure from HUAC, movie industry heads met to form the Waldorf Agreement, creating a blacklist that denied employment to anyone suspected of communist ties in the movie industry. In 1960, the groundbreaking film Spartacus, written by blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo, premiered in theaters across the United States. Much more than a Hollywood blockbuster, Spartacus was a turning point that challenged prevailing anti-communist attitudes. Americans, by embracing this movie, ended the blacklist and affirmed their commitment to free speech. In the month before the Waldorf Agreement, 10 Hollywood writers were called for HUAC, led by Jerry Pinal Thomas, to answer questions on subversive ideas in their movies. One of the men was Dalton Trumbo. He didn't know it at the time, but he was about to become the 10's unofficial leader. Mr. Trumbo, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? You must have a reason for asking that. I'm the one asking the questions here. Answer the question. I'd love to see what evidence you have. Answer yes or no. That question could be answered yes or no only by a moron or a slave. Take him away. The First Amendment of the United States guarantees freedom of speech for individuals. The Hollywood Ten argued, unsuccessfully, that this right had been infringed when they were called to give public testimony regarding their political opinions. They weren't charged with anything, but for refusing to cooperate with HUAC, all were given year-long jail sentences for contempt of Congress. They convicted us of contempt of Congress. And that verdict was true. I did have contempt for that Congress. <laughs> the Hollywood Ten came out of jail to a landscape transformed by the Waldorf Agreement. Hundreds in Hollywood had been, had been blacklisted, fired, and could no longer earn a living in their chosen fields. Some blacklistees could not take the pressure. To return to work, they named names, collaborating with HUAC to destroy former friends' careers. But some blacklisted writers, like Trumbo, refused to compromise. At first, these writers believed that they could work outside Hollywood. But economic pressure forced Trumbo back into the screenplay business, writing scripts under fronts or false names for a fraction of what he had previously earned. It was like trying to find a job in a foggy street without knowing anybody. Hollywood was not supposed to be hiring blacklistees, yet every movie on this board written by blacklisted writers was recognized in the Academy Awards for the year label. Trumbo began to organize. The blacklist will only be broken by the sheer excellence of the work of two or three blacklisted writers. Each of us, individually, must use the excellence of our work to compel the use of our name. This seems to me to be the next step. Trumbo sought to create the event that would break the blacklist. He had the idea, but he needed the people to pull it off. What he didn't know was that Kirk Douglas, an independent-minded actor and producer, had recently bought the rights to a story that would give Trumbo his opening. It might have seemed like Douglas was just engaging his ego by making Spartacus. Ben Hur, Charlton Heston's heart-pounding tale of Roman times, was on track to sweep the Oscars in 1959. And Douglas had only been offered the role of the bad guy in that. Spartacus could give Douglas a chance to play the hero. But Douglas's part of his project had something different. It was adapted from the best-selling novel by Howard Fast, a known communist. Fast had printed Spartacus in his own basement when no publishing house in America would touch it. On paper, Spartacus was exactly the kind of movie the blacklist was supposed to stop. And the fact that Howard Fast proved incompetent at screenwriting soon made the project even more of a political hot potato. Dear God, it was awful. It was as if he hadn't read his own novel. I had an idea. Dalton Trumbo. I asked Eddie Lewis to set a meeting. He agreed to write the screenplay for us with Eddie fronting. Douglas, like many in Hollywood, hated the blacklist. But the blacklist 
especially dangerous for actors and producers. They couldn't hunker it down at home, working from their bathtubs. Douglas hesitated to publicly support a blacklisty. Trumbo was sympathetic to Douglas's concerns, but he also saw in Spartacus the turning point he had been waiting for. In great excitement, he wrote a close friend, as you may know, I have done the scheme plan Spartacus. When Spartacus is near completion, I plan to make a power play. I'm going to go on strike. I'm going to demand my name on the movie. The tremendous leakage on Spartacus will be of great assistance to me. This leakage was visited to Trumbo's home by Spartacus actors, British stars Peter Ustinov and Charles Zotten. The actors decided that they disliked some of their lines and rewrote them, not once, but many times. Trumbo telegrammed Douglas twice, first to complain, then, 20 minutes after my wire regarding the two actors, I arrived at the decision that I shall quit this picture absolutely. Here was Trumbo's turning point. He was now a black lassie who had regained the power to quit. It was a disaster. It could have shut us down permanently. I realized at that moment what I needed to do. We had to put Trumbo's name on the picture. Douglas went to Trumbo's house to make a deal that Trumbo's name would be put on the skip when Spartacus came out. Dalton, believe it or not, I want you to know that I was thinking about how I put your name on the picture before I got those <coughs> ink telegrams. With this encounter, something had changed, something had turned, and it didn't take long before every gossip in Hollywood knew it. Many in the movie industry rushed in to capitalize on what Douglas and Trumbo had started. Renowned director Otto Preminger infuriated Douglas by publicly announcing in January 1960 that Trumbo would be given sole screenplay credit on his film, Exodus. You've got to hand it to Otto. He saw that the train had already left the station with Spartacus breaking the blacklist. Not only did he run to catch up with it, he jumped into the front car and claimed to be the engineer. Preminger's story was reported on the front pages of newspapers across America. Encouraged by the turn of events, actor producer Frank Sinatra openly hired Blacklist D. Albert Moss. But McCarthyism was not a spent force. 1960 was an election year. Sinatra was very close to John F. Kennedy. When the American Legion, the largest organization of war veterans in America, picketed Sinatra, Kennedy sank in the polls. Joseph Kennedy Sr. sent Sinatra a telegram saying, Maltz or us? Sinatra fired Maltz. In Spartacus's iconic climax, the slave army led by Spartacus against the Romans had just been defeated. The survivors are assembled and told that if they identify Spartacus, they will be allowed to live as slaves and not be crucified. As Spartacus stands to identify himself, his men rise with him and shout, I am Spartacus, denying the Romans their final victory. The message that men must stand and speak together to escape tyranny was lost on no one. Spartacus, the movie, would give Americans a choice, allow the blacklist to continue or destroy it. The movie premiered in October 1960. All hail Spartacus! It is in the same giant class as Ben Hur. <laughs> a story sold to Universal from a book written by a commie. And the screenscript was written by a commie, so don't go see it. Tremendous is the only word for it. It is a spotted, uneven drama. The middle phase is pretentious and tedious, concerned with the dull strife of politics. But many people went to see the movie anyway especially some very important people. President Kennedy attends movie and capital, shows support for Spartacus, walks through the American Legion's picket line. The message was clear. The political tide had turned. Most people couldn't see a communist message in Spartacus, and Trumbo was hailed as a champion of free speech. The movie Spartacus was an economic turning point. After Spartacus, movie studios were able to openly hire blacklistees. It was also a political turning point. President Kennedy used the movie to signal that he didn't support the blacklist and that U.S. would no longer have free reign. Spartacus was a turning point in history because it was a top earning movie of 1960. The public went to see it in droves, unafraid that this might be seen as un-American activity. Society recognized that suppressing ideas violated the right to free speech. In today's polarized times, the lessons of the blacklist are more important than ever. We must remember history's mistakes. For if we forget them, a situation where our First Amendment rights are violated will easily repeat itself. I'm Spartacus! We must remember Spartacus's call in order to protect America's future.